um, opportunity to come talk today about uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, it is uh, one day prior to the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy appreciation day. So um, it, we're right on uh, track there. But I, it's uh, um, my uh, great pleasure to be able to talk about this. So let me see here. Okay, so for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy overview, the talk's gonna be hopefully a little bit educational and a little bit of an update as well. And we're gonna talk about what is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, what causes it, what are the main symptoms, what are the central role of outflow obstruction. We're gonna talk a little bit about the, um, this idea of scarring or fibrosis. And finally, we're gonna uh, talk about risk of abnormal heart rhythms and how uh, contemporary treatments uh, have changed the overall um, prognosis. So uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is um, unexplained heart muscle thickening, often due to genetic variation in the heart's contraction proteins. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail. I've got a couple of figures off here to the right. Uh, one is a picture of a, a heart with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy showing some of the heart muscle thickening here within the septum, which is the a part of the heart that separates the left ventricle from the right ventricle. And down here below, you see a, a normal heart uh, by comparison, uh, showing that the septum here is much thinner than it is in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy heart. Now, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy isn't exactly rare, but it's not exactly common. It's, it's present somewhere between one in 200 and one in 500 people. And that equates to about 8,000 to 20,000 patients here in the Seattle metro area, about 15 to 30 some thousand in the state of Washington and about 660,000 uh, to 1.6 million uh, patients nationally. Um, the differences here have a little bit to do with how HCM uh, prevalence is defined. Uh, some of it is cross-sectional, that's the one in 500, and some of it is more of a lifetime estimate of what HCM would be like, and that's about one in 200. We think of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as a number one cause of sudden death in young people and athletes. And, uh, although it's often asymptomatic, about half the patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have few, if any, symptoms. It can also be a major cause of symptoms, including uh, chest pain or angina, uh, heart failure, and abnormal heart rhythms. These are some of the patterns that of, of hypertrophy that can occur um, in, again, normal heart here off to the left, and then what we call a sigmoidal appearance, where the heart muscle thickening is isolated to the base of the heart we call this reverse curve hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and this is where the hypertrophy is in the is much more prominent. It's usually in the middle part of the heart and apical, and this neutral here, where the the heart muscle thickening is pretty much the same kind of all throughout the septum. Each of these has their own sort of sets of um, uh, symptoms that are most often associated with it. This, for example, is more likely to be associated with a genetic change, more likely to be associated with obstruction, whereas apical HCM is, more like, is, is less likely to be associated with obstruction. We'll talk about that in a little bit. How is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy diagnosed? Well, HCM diagnosis is considered when there is unexplained heart muscle thickening on either echo or cardiac MRI. And I'll show you some examples of those in the next couple of slides. Wall thickness is normal uh, when it's 0 0.6 to 1.1 centimeters. We consider that within the normal range. Anything greater than 1.5 centimeters is abnormal and consistent with a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy diagnosis. Uh, we have this intermediate sort of range here between 1.1 and 1.5 centimeters, uh, but most HCM hearts are uh, thicker than this 1.5 centimeters. Um, HCM has traditionally been a diagnosis of exclusion, so we make sure that uh, none of the other factors that can cause heart muscle thickening are present, or at least not sufficient to be able to explain the observed amount of heart muscle thickening. And these other types of uh, causes of heart muscle thickening include things like high blood pressure, um, extreme exercise, other genetic conditions or syndromes, things like Fabry disease, and then some what we call infiltrative disorders or uh, situations where there's something that's being deposited within the heart muscle in making it thicker than what it should be. So here's a couple of examples of uh, what we, um, the, the tools that we use to try to detect the heart muscle thickening. Uh, 
Um, this is an echocardiogram over here to the left and a cardiac MRI over here to the right. This is actually on the same patient, although the images of the two are reversed a little bit, but just gives you an example of what the technology allows us to see. Echo is very good at uh, temporal resolution. It allows us to understand the physiology, pressure information, things like that. Whereas on the right, we get a lot more anatomical information from the MRI, and, and in particular, we get some information about scarring and fibrosis. We look at um, we look at this in a different view. Again, same patient heart. This is actually the same heart as on the last slide. Um, this is echo on the left and a cardiac MRI on the right, and you can see just how much better we can see the heart uh, in terms of its heart muscle thickening uh, than we can by echo. On the this image here on the right, the heart muscle is dark, the blood pool is in white. And um, what we saw in the last image was this slice right here going down through here. We got a little bit of the heart muscle thickening. We couldn't see that on the echo. We can clearly see it on the cardiac MRI that the maximal wall thickness here is about uh, 20 millimeters or 2.0 centimeters. So that's consistent with the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So what causes this heart muscle thickening? Well, in about 50% of cases, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is caused by genetic changes within the, heart's, uh, within the heart proteins that are responsible for the heart contraction. We call that the sarcomere. There is definite or moderate evidence that about 11 different genes contribute to this process. The most common two are these listed here, myosin binding protein C and, and beta myosin. Those are uh, account for um, somewhere uh, on the order of about um, 50 to 70% of HCM. Um, and there's probably more hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy genes to be identified. We think of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as often family-based and such that there's a 50% chance that first degree relatives will also carry the genetic change. Now, what's a little less clear is what causes the other 50% of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, there's been uh, speculation that there uh, is, are these opaque genes that we just don't know enough about. Um, there may be variability in the way that the genes that we know about are expressed. Uh, there may be cumulative effects of more common genetic changes. There's, in fact, a recent study suggesting this may be the case. And then there may just be some um, environmental or accumulated changes um, that, that occur over the course of time. And I tend to refer that as a variant of cardiac aging. So just the way the heart tends to age. I'm gonna take a step back and sort of review um, genetics and how the genetics relates to the development of the heart muscle thickening. So genetics here is the study of DNA and DNA is the molecule of life. We all have uh, 22 pairs of chromosomes plus either an XX or an XY chromosome. And on this, there are 3 billion base pairs or letters uh, that make up the DNA uh, within our, and within our uh, cells. Um, the DNA strand is, is, uh, um, is shown here. And on this DNA, there are about 20 to 25,000 different genes. Now these genes get uh, read out and expressed through a uh, process that includes transcription from DNA into RNA and then translation from this RNA into a protein, such that the spelling of the DNA uh, directly um, uh, provides the information needed to be able to make a functional protein. These proteins are basically the worker bees within our bodies. They take on distinct shapes and functions and uh, are really the effector molecules that, um, uh, that are coded by the DNA. Genes and traits are inherited. And uh, this is sort of a diagram here that kind of goes over how uh, inheritance of these common uh, genetic variants works. And so here um, up above, we have the parents and the parents have either dimples or no dimples. It looks like in this one, dad has dimples here uh, as coded by um, one of the genetic, uh, one of the genes here on this white chromosome. And all of the other chromosomes between mom and dad uh, show no dimples. Now, because uh, dimples are an autosomal dominant type of trait, there's a 50-50 chance 
of each of the kids inheriting this yellow uh, chromosome, this yellow gene on the white chromosome compared to the green gene on the blue chromosome. And when you look at the four children uh, of this uh, couple, we see that indeed um, one son and one daughter have inherited the uh, dimple gene and, uh, and thus have dimples, whereas the other two do not. This is um, common genetic variants that, that share this type of inheritance are dimples and earlobes uh, attached versus free, um, thumbs, which are curved versus straight, the ability to roll your tongue and eye color. So those are just kind of some fun things. But genetic variation that cause disease are inherited in much the same way. So misspellings within the DNA, within the genetic code, uh, can cause profound disease. Here's an example where the guanine, uh, the, uh, the, the nucleic acid was changed from a G to an A, which then creates a difference in the amino acids uh, that make up the proteins. And when the, this DNA is converted into a protein, we get um, proteins that are shaped differently or maybe bind differently. Uh, and therefore function differently. And that change in function is what um, eventually leads to the disease process. This is a picture of, uh, a detailed picture of the cardiac uh, sarcomere, which is the main contraction apparatus within the heart. Um, this is what allows either the skeletal muscle, our, our peripheral muscles or our heart muscle to contract. You can see this is a complex process. There's a number of different proteins that are uh, need to be here. They need to be able to interact appropriately, um, keep the same spatial distances, and then uh, bind to the same degree. Uh, when there are changes in any of these proteins, they can lead to differences in the way the heart contracts. And in, in certain cases, that can lead to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But it's important to recognize that the genetic change itself is not the disease. Most people who carry the HCM genetic change are not born with heart muscle thickening, although we can often detect subtle findings such as vigorous heart muscle contraction. Heart muscle thickening, um, however, can occur later in life. And most commonly, there's uh, a group that develops hypertrophy during puberty. So as the body is growing, the heart grows and the heart tends to grow a little bit exuberantly. And then there's a second peak in midlife between the ages about 40 and 60, where we seem to identify a lot more individuals with new heart muscle thickening. Now, important to note that not all carriers of the genetic change go on to develop HCM. And that means there's uh, the technical term for this is something we call incomplete penetrance but it just means that you can carry the gene and never develop the disease. Um, all along those lines, family members with the same genetic change can have vastly different clinical courses. They can have vastly different degrees of heart muscle thickening. And um, as noted above, some people in that family may not develop heart muscle thickening or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at all. So what are the symptoms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? So first off, uh, how is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy detected? Well, there's no routine way that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy comes to clinical attention. Symptoms are one of the most common ways, um, but it's sometimes it comes to uh, clinical attention because of a routine exam where they hear a heart murmur, or perhaps there's a screening event um, involving EKG or an echocardiogram. Um, or maybe it's family-based screening, or maybe it's um, a sports physical that kids have to go through before competing. Any of these uh, are opportunities for us to try to identify HCM, because we like to try to identify it before an acute event occurs. And these acute events are abnormal heart rhythms, things like atrial fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia, a cardiac arrest, uh, or a stroke. And uh, it'd be great if we were able to identify uh, HCM because we have treatment uh, for each of these um, possibilities. So the symptoms of HCM are, um, uh, are, uh, can, can vary from person to person. Most commonly, it's some type of exercise intolerance. And exercise intolerance can take many different forms, but it often involves shortness of breath or chest pain, primarily chest pain with exercise. 
and then uh, pain that resolves with rest and maybe recurs the next time you start to do that same type of activity. Um, it, symptoms can also include palpitations, that just a, a sudden sensation of your heart um, beating funny. Uh, it can include symptoms of lightheadedness or dizziness or sudden fainting. And lastly, it can include um, this possibility of sudden cardiac arrest or sudden death. And sometimes, unfortunately, that is the first um, symptomatic presentation of the disease. Causes of the symptoms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are um, involve primarily uh, outflow tract obstruction, and we're going to talk about that in a little more detail. Um, it can involve heart failure or the development of congestion or fluid retention, or it can be involve symptoms of low output, that your heart's just not able to pump the blood forward enough um, because the heart is thick, the chamber is small, and your heart, you're get very dependent upon your heart rate for it to be able to need to exercise. Um, the symptoms can be due to abnormal heart rhythms. So some of the things we talked about on the last slide, like light, sudden lightheadedness, fainting, uh, can be due to abnormal heart rhythms. And then finally, when uh, patients are on medications, medications themselves can often cause symptoms and we have to be careful about uh, dosing some of those. Hypertrophy though, uh, is usually not the direct cause of symptoms. So the, the, even though the defining feature of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is heart muscle thickening, the heart muscle thickening itself is usually not the direct cause of symptoms. In addition to symptoms, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients tend to go down a specific pathways. Now people can cross over pathways, but, but they tend to identify along certain uh, routes that now about 50% of patients are asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. Um, they may be still at risk of things like abnormal heart rhythms, um, but they have few symptoms in their everyday lives. Um, they can have, like I, I described, some angina or chest discomfort, particularly with exercise or shortness of breath or heart failure. Um, again, shortness of breath, particularly with that exercise. And when I say exercise, I really just mean any type of activity. That can be just walking up a flight of stairs. Uh, it can be going for walks, going up hills in particular. Um, more serious types of clinical pathways um, that patients can, can experience is what we describe as end-stage hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where the squeeze of the heart tends to deteriorate over time. They can develop abnormal heart rhythms, uh, called one called atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation can put patients at risk of stroke, and we tend to treat that with blood thinning medications. And then finally, some patients do develop a sudden death or sudden cardiac arrest um, in absence of a whole lot of these other symptoms. What's mediating a lot of these pathways are these two features that are, I look at as sort of the defining features of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and that is left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and fibrosis or scarring of the heart muscle uh, that may or may not be linked to the obstruction, but um, is not very well understood to date. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the central role of outflow tract obstruction in the HCM disease process and, and how it might relate to symptoms. So here's a little schematic of what we define as outflow tract obstruction. And so this is a, a tough term, but it really means that there is obstruction, the blood flow leaving the heart. And um, when there's uh, obstruction to blood flow leaving the heart, we get a narrow part um, right here, higher pressure out here within the ventricle, lower pressure out here in the aorta, such that the heart has to work a lot harder to push that blood out and it would have to if there was no obstruction here whatsoever. And that extra work uh, that's required of the heart uh, causes the heart to demand more oxygen. Uh, it also uh, can lead to um, uh, scarring or fibrosis over time. Uh, and also can lead to a reduction in peak heart rate with exercise. The symptoms that patients experience with obstruction are most commonly the chest pain or chest discomfort with exercise and shortness of breath. Um, we call the difference in these pressure here is um, a gradient. And the gradient is the difference in pressure with inside the ventricle compared to outside the ventricle. And that degree of obstruction or that gradient 
isn't a fixed number. That's uh, one of the fascinating things about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and this obstruction is it can vary quite a bit from day to day. Um, it can vary uh, with exercise. So when patients exercise, their heart starts to squeeze a little bit harder. When the heart squeezes harder, the obstruction, could, the obstruction increases. Dehydration can do it. Bearing down or doing what we call a Valsalva maneuver can do it. And then any type of physical or emotional stress uh, can also lead to increases in this obstruction or this gradient. Whenever there's an increase in the amount of obstruction, you can anticipate uh, that the symptoms may increase as well. So here's a, a diagram of a normal heart and showing just um, blood flow. And I was just gonna go over this real quick before we turn our attention to the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy heart. So blood flows back from the lungs to the, the LA here, and this is the left atrium. And it crosses the mitral valve, the M, which is the MV here, goes into the heart and they get pumps, it gets pumped out through the aorta, it almost does a U-turn here in the heart and then comes back out the aorta. And normally this area right here, this is what we call the left ventricular outflow tract, the outflow from the left ventricle is nice and open and wide. Um, blood passes through there at about one meters per second and flows into the aorta about that same velocity as well. This is a picture of a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and you can see this additional heart muscle thickening here in the septum, which is right adjacent to where the blood is trying to leave the heart. Here again, blood would flow into the left atrium across the mitral valve, make that U-turn and try to leave through the aorta. But in this instance, the mitral leaflets here are a little bit longer than what they should be, and the heart muscle is a little bit thicker here, all of which makes this area very small. And with that causes the obstruction to blood flow leaving the heart. The blood flow after it passes the obstruction can be a little bit turbulent shown in here, but this is a high pressure ventricle now, and this is a lower pressure aorta. And uh, depending on the severity of the obstruction, this amount of obstruction can reach 100 millimeters of mercury. So that's almost double what your blood pressure is. And so if your blood pressure is 120 or 130 millimeters of mercury, the pressure inside the heart might reach up to 230 millimeters of mercury. So quite a bit higher. And again, that makes the heart have to work harder, ask for more oxygen, uh, all that kinds of stuff. And that can then lead to increasing symptoms. This is an echocardiogram kind of showing the whole process. The process is not usually related directly to the amount of heart muscle thickening that, it, that occurs here, has more to do with the motion of the mitral valve. Now, I'm not gonna go over uh, the physiology of this um, in detail today. Uh, I don't think we have time to do that. Um, but, but in essence, these mitral valve leaflets are moving up and blocking off the blood flow right here um, from the heart. So here's the left atrium down at the bottom, the left ventricle is up here, uh, in the aorta, in the aortic valve right here. So blood goes from the bottom up to this chamber, makes that U-turn and comes out through the aorta. Um, and meanwhile, that whole process is blocked off by uh, this mitral valve right here, and that causes the obstruction. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is now thought of as a predominantly obstructive disease process. About 70% of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have some degree of obstruction. I think we can roughly break them down into thirds. About one third doesn't have obstruction. About one third has obstruction only at rest, um, uh, obstruction at rest and with exercise. And uh, one third has obstruction only with exercise. So like I said before, exercise always makes the obstruction or the gradient higher. And some people don't have obstruction at rest, but only have it when they exercise. Or you know, when I say exercise, I'm not talking about getting on a bike and uh, going on the Burke Gilman or something like that. I'm just talking about walking up a flight of stairs. Now, like I mentioned on the last slide, the alterations in the mitral valve and papillary muscle play an important role in this process and may play a more important role than the amount of heart muscle thickening itself. These changes to the mitral valve and the papillary muscles, which are part of the uh, tethering forces on the valve, um, those are, are abnormal in a majority of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We don't exactly know why because the genes are not expressed in the mitral valve tissue, 
But I do think that they may be um, sequela of the genetic changes and how it affects the contraction of the heart, uh, both in utero and in uh, during the growth phases of the heart. So we have a couple of op different options for the treatment of obstruction. And um, by reducing the force of contraction of the heart, we can decrease the amount of obstruction by pushing the blood past the mitral valves a little bit more gently, the valve leaflets don't move as much and they don't cause as much obstruction. So medications that are co most commonly used are beta blockers. That's usually uh, what doctors reach forth first, something like metoprolol or atenolol. Um, secondly is um, calcium channel blockers, called, I think a medication called verapamil in particular. And then thirdly, some providers use a medicine called disapyramide. We've been using that quite a bit here at UW. However, there's considerable practice variability among cardiologists and even among HCM providers as to how best to utilize these, whether or not we go high doses of beta blockers before switching to calcium channel blockers, maybe we do a little bit of both. Some providers don't like to mix and match. Um, others uh, like myself like to use lower doses of a couple of these in order to, because um, I found that to be a little bit more effective for reducing patient symptoms. Additionally, there are new generations of medications that are around the corner. Uh, one, Navicamptin is scheduled to be FDA approved at the end of April, um, but uh, I'm not gonna talk about that in detail today uh, because it is not FDA approved as of yet. There's a class of medicines. This is all on a class of medicines called myosin modulator therapy. And there's uh, a couple of different companies that are working on medications um, that more directly influence the contraction properties of the heart uh, and are much better at reducing the force of contraction. And all I, uh, the one thing I will say about this is just that there's a lot of excitement about this uh, because of the results of the preliminary clinical trials. We were fortunate here at the University of Washington to have some patient volunteers uh, who are willing to take part in some of those clinical trials that help bring some of that um, medications on the cusp of FDA approval. Um, for patients that have severe sy symptoms despite the use of medications, um, there are now uh, uh, and have been a number of different procedures that uh, can be done. The most common procedures available are surgical myectomy and alcohol septal ablation. There's a few others that have some niche applications, um, but I'm not gonna go over those today, something like a mitral valve clip procedure. Um, the choice of procedure must be individualized, factoring the heart anatomy, the surgical risk factors, and patient preference, among other things. And there's no right answer uh, across the board for all hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. So this is a um, schematic of what a surgical myectomy would look like. This was um, uh, originally, um, uh, the surgical technique for this was uh, uh, brought about at the NIH in the 1960s by Dr. Morrow. Um, and uh, Eugene Braunwald was the cardiologist that was at the NIH at the time that worked with HCM patients. He's the grandfather of cardiology and probably the most famous cardiology uh, cardiologist internationally. Um, so this procedure is an open heart surgery uh, where uh, the surgeons will do a sternotomy and that's an incision down straight down the middle of the chest through the sternum. Uh, once they can get to the heart, they uh, will um, put the patient on a bypass machine and then stop the heart. And the bypass machine takes over the pump function of the heart uh, while uh, they're able to operate on the heart. The surgeons don't cut into the ventricle itself. They cut into the, um, into the aorta. They look down across the aortic valve and look down into the heart. And from that view, they look at the, they have a nice view of how blood would be leaving the heart and they can see the septum from there. They take their incision or their scalpel here and make an incision in that area of heart muscle thickening. And the goal of this is not to remove all of the extra heart muscle that would take uh, a, um, too long in order to be done safely. What they do is they create a, a channel within the thickened heart muscle for blood to exit. And so they're just taking enough muscle to make a nice passageway so that the blood can go around that mitral valve and leave the heart without causing uh, any obstruction. 
Many surgeons will also do an intraoperative stress test to, so that they know uh, not only that they've taken enough muscle, but they've taken enough muscle um, out in order to um, eliminate any obstruction uh, under stress circumstances as well. Um, a second procedure is something we call an alcohol septal ablation. In this procedure, um, which is an alternative to surgical myectomy, um, a catheter is advanced uh, through the arterial system uh, down towards the heart and um, brought into uh, the arteries that supply blood to the heart. So they find uh, the one artery, usually the, these are called septal perforators, that supply blood to the area of heart muscle thickening right next to the aorta, right next to the mitral valve. And we inject a little bit of ethanol in there. So we're talking about one milliliter of ethanol, so a very small amount into this area. And, and essentially what is happening is the interventional cardiologist is creating a localized um, and controlled heart attack. We can control where it is, what size it is, all of that. But, but essentially what we're doing is creating a small heart attack in that area. And over time, that heart muscle is absorbed and uh, replaced by scar tissue. And that scar tissue takes up less room. And the result of that is that the septum uh, becomes thinner. And uh, so it is another form of what we call septal reduction, which is the blanket term for both septal myectomy and alcohol ablation. When we look at the um, comparison of surgical myectomy to alcohol septal ablation, we see here that surgical myectomy improves symptoms and reduces gradient alcohol septal ablation does as well. There's a higher rate of procedural success with surgery compared to septal ablation. And that has largely to do with two factors. One is um, the surgeon can directly visualize where they need to take the extra heart muscle out and do it at the time of surgery. Whereas the interventionalist um, using catheter technique is dependent on where the arteries take the blood. Uh, and it also is a little bit, um, uh, we don't always get the final results of the procedure at the time of the procedure. And so even though we can have some short-term benefit, uh, we won't see the, uh, the final results until about three to four weeks after the procedure when, you're, when the patient's done uh, turning the heart muscle over into scar tissue. And then we can start to see how much benefit the procedure actually um, brought about. The, with, surgical, with the surgery, there's about a five to seven days in the hospital. With alcohol ablation, it's about two to three days. With surgical myectomy, the recovery is longer, uh, one to three months versus a week or two with the alcohol septal ablation. And with surgery, there's a less uh, uh, rate of needing a pacemaker afterwards, a higher rate of needing a pacemaker with the alcohol septal ablation. So in general, um, in general terms, surgical myectomy is, um, in my opinion, a little bit better procedure for those who are at low operative risks. That is, um, their risks of having major complications with surgery are lower because the procedural success of it is a little bit higher. But you have to have that conversely with alcohol septal ablation where the risks are lower, the recovery time is better but that's balanced with maybe having to go back and do a second procedure or maybe needing a higher rate of needing a pacemaker. So there's lots of factors that influence the choice of procedure for each individual patient, including age, risk factors, operative risks, heart anatomy, and patient preference. Outcomes are better when performed by surgeons and interventionalists at high volume HCM centers. And this has been shown over and over again. There's a lot of surgeons out there who are willing to do the surgical myectomy but you're asking the surgeon to do something different than they usually do in everyday practice, and that is to become a sculptor. They have to be able to cut into the muscle and know exactly how much muscle to take out. If they don't take out enough, you're left with obstruction. And if they take out too much, you have a hole in the heart that's connecting the left and the right ventricle. And unless you have somebody who does a lot of them, uh, you may come out with a less than satisfactory uh, result. I'm going to turn my attention a little bit to this idea of scarring and fibrosis. So scarring and fibrosis, um, I can use those two terms sort of uh, interchangeably. And that's a central feature of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and it occurs to some extent in about 50 to 70% of patients. 
We don't always know what causes the hypertrophy and scarring. We do think it's a direct result of some of the genetic changes themselves, maybe a result of the um, forceful contraction that the genetic changes bring about. It may also be the result of some of the higher pressures uh, that occur in there because of the obstruction. What I have down here at the bottom are, uh, is a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy heart with a thickened septum shown here in, with the red arrow. And you can see the white stuff right here, which is the scarring compared to the, the stuff here, which is the darker is the muscle itself. And we can identify the areas of scarring with uh, using the MRI with gadolinium. Gadolinium is our contrast agent and it goes into the areas of the heart muscle and sticks around longer in areas of scarring and fibrosis. And we can take advantage of that by imaging about 30 minutes after injection of the gadolinium. And we see these areas where um, there's persistent gadolinium uh, and there's increased intracellular space. So we can not only identify this with gadolinium, we can actually have that, we actually have the tools to quantify it. And we can identify uh, the amount of heart muscle thickening, uh, I'm sorry, the amount of heart muscle scarring relative to the mass of the, of the heart. And we uh, generally express that as a percentage. Does it mean that the, in, um, the entire area of that heart is replaced by scar tissue, but there's scar in between the live and living heart muscles? Um, this scarring and fibrosis over time uh, can lead to heart muscle stiffening, reduction in, in the squeeze of the heart, and an increased risk of abnormal heart rhythms. I'm going to show this uh, sort of an example here on this slide. So we think that about 70% of HCM patients have some degree of, H of uh, late gadolinium enhancement, and, um, which is our MRI marker of scarring or fibrosis. We think that this likely increases to a certain degree uh, over time. All this is quite variable from person to person. And I've followed patients for a decade now with very minimal change in the amount of scarring that they've had. Um, with this increase in scarring, we can see uh, that the heart loses some of its forcefulness of its contraction. And so we measure the force of contraction of the heart by something we call the ejection fraction and normal ejection fraction uh, at the start here and a lower ejection fraction over time. With that progressive uh, loss of the contraction of the heart and the forcefulness of the contraction, some patients actually lose their obstruction. That sounds like a good thing, but it may not be because of the means or the mechanism of which that is being lost. And finally, we get this, uh, this term is called compliance. It's the opposite of um, a stiffness. And so something that is non-compliant is something that is very stiff. And for uh, patients who have progressive scarring, they can get a fairly stiff heart. And with that stiffening comes an increase in heart failure symptoms. So this is, sounds a little bit scary and a little bit daunting, but um, scar although it's scarring is common in HCM, it's clinically significant in only a small minority of patients. And there's only about 5% of patients who progress to end-stage hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where that squeeze or the contractility of the heart uh, tends to drop off. Um, the fibrosis and scarring uh, contribute to the risk of heart failure and to abnormal heart rhythms, as I mentioned. And unfortunately, right now, there are no current treatments directed at the scarring and fibrosis process. We think that perhaps uh, treating or modulating the symptomatic obstruction may reduce the amount of scarring and fibrosis, and there may be some role for some of the new medications in, in reducing this process. That um, is data that yet has to be confirmed in large populations. And so lastly, I'm gonna turn my attention to the risk of abnormal heart rhythms. Um, and so patients with HCM are really at higher risk of uh, two main uh, heart arrhythmias or, or abnormal heart rhythms. One is atrial fibrillation shown here on the left, and the other is ventricular tachycardia, which is here on the right. Atrial fibrillation is a pretty common uh, heart rhythm as uh, individuals get older. It's more common in patients with HCM than in the general population. This is um, an abnormal heart rhythm that starts up in the atrium or the top chamber of the heart. It's chaotic uh, and it sends electrical activity kind of swirling around the atrium and sends signals down to the bottom part of the heart or the ventricles kind of irregularly or at random. And thus that results in a pulse or a heart contraction that is at, uh, seemingly irregular. 
Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. And then conversely is abnormal heart rhythms that emanate from that area of scarring within the left ventricle. And those uh, abnormal heart rhythms we call ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Fortunately, these are not very common, um, but they're pretty significant when they occur. Um, they do carry the risk of, of uh, sudden death uh, so that if you experience uh, ventricular tach tachycardia, uh, we take that very seriously and uh, uh, either get defibrillators in you or uh, start to uh, treat with medications that we're confident will um, suppress the arrhythmias. Atrial fibrillation, as I mentioned, is this chaotic rhythm that results in an irregular pulse. We refer to this as an irregularly irregular, which means that the pulses, the pulses are coming not in any type of grouped beating. They don't come in any type of pattern at all. They just kind of have the, the, the beats will come almost at random. Patients have a wide variety of symptoms uh, when they go into atrial fibrillation. And, and some patients are completely asymptomatic and some people can notice it right away and uh, they have chest pain or shortness of breath and need to go to the emergency room for uh, urgent evaluations. Um, we get concerned about atrial fibrillation because with this, there's no organized atrial contraction. So the top part of the heart is no longer contracting. And that means that blood clots can form within that, those chambers and in particular one area called the left atrial appendage. When blood clots form in there, they can break off. And when they break off and go through the bloodstream, well, they're gonna end up someplace that you probably don't want them. Uh, and most importantly of those is to the brain. Uh, and so we, uh, atrial fibrillation is an important cause of strokes. And it's recommended that all hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with atrial fibrillation start on blood thinning medications to prevent or reduce the risk of uh, stroke. Um, atrial fibrillation is also a progressive disease. Um, and we, there's a saying in cardiology that AFib begins, begets AFib. Uh, so the more atrial fibrillation that you have, um, the harder it is to get rid of, uh, and the more likely it is that it's gonna be a persistent rhythm. Now, some people can live decades uh, and be relatively asymptomatic with their atrial fibrillation. Patients with ATM tend to uh, have a little, little more symptoms um, uh, than that. And, and generally it's something that we need to treat. When talking about uh, treatment of atrial fibrillation, um, first step is uh, usually cardioversion, getting patients back into normal rhythm by giving the heart a shock, uh, putting pads on the chest, giving the heart a shock after they're deeply sedated by their anesthesiology friends. Um, and that's a pretty, is a pretty simple procedure in all honesty. Um, it's not often, uh, however, it's not a long-term success strategy. What we have to do is identify and treat the triggers or the other contributors to the atrial fibrillation process. Sometimes it's things like weight management or control of sleep apnea. Uh, if the atrial fibrillation is exercise or stress related, uh, sometimes we go through some stress modification techniques. There are some medications we can use, um, beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. So metoprolol or diltiazem or verapamil are often used to control heart rate. There's blood thinners, as I mentioned, that we use to reduce the risk of stroke. And then there are some medications we can use for control of the rhythm, trying to maintain normal rhythm. Um, and these are available, uh, but all of those medications are imperfect. Uh, and uh, there's um, the risk of breakthrough is uh, is pretty high. Um, for individuals who have atrial fibrillation that is symptomatic and recurrent, uh, catheter ablation uh, may be an option. And in this technique, we uh, use some catheters, bring them up to the heart, uh, cross over to the left atrium, and we put some uh, uh, burns in the heart. Uh, in specific places where we think that the triggers for atrial fibrillation are coming from. And by doing that, we can uh, reduce the risk of recurrence of the atrial fibrillation. The other type of abnormal heart rhythm is ventricular tachycardia. And as I mentioned, uh, ventricular tachycardia can cause sudden collapse or sudden death. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is among the most common causes of sudden death in young people and in trained athletes. And there are some heart muscle factors that are involved with this, both the thickening uh, of the heart muscle and also the disarray, but also the scarring and fibrosis that can occur as part of the disease process. These abnormal heart rhythms are often triggered by exercise. And uh, so we will often see them in the athlete population if there's a subclinical case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. 
and the exercise can reduce the blood supply, increase the oxygen um, demands of the heart. Uh, it can cause an increase in the catecholamines or these stress hormones. And um, when people are exercising, they're often dehydrated or they have electrolyte imbalances, which can also lead to uh, predisposed to abnormal heart rhythms. The specter of HCM uh, sudden death or the spe specter of sudden death in HCM is, has been um, uh, over the field for a long time. And there's a lot of uh, bias historically as to what type of patients were coming to clinical attention. Um, and initially, the only the highest risk individuals were being identified with HCM and were being treated uh, or, or they're being assessed for the risk of, of sudden death. Turns out the average risk of sudden death in the HCM is quite low. It's, it's probably 0.5% per year or lower, um, but there are clearly some small percentage of HCM patients who are at higher risk. Uh, because of that's recommended that all HCM patients be assessed for that risk. We'll talk about how we do that in just a second. And their risk should be periodically reevaluated. Re it's not a one and done type of thing because the heart continues to change over time. Research has identified some markers that suggest which individuals might be at increased risk, but the event prediction is imperfect. Um, for individuals that we think are at highest risk, we can implant defibrillators. Uh, at least that's an option for patients. And the key to all of this, because of the uncertainty in terms of the risk prediction, is that we uh, adopt a shared decision-making approach that my job is not to tell you what the right thing to do is, my job is to inform the risks and let's have a conversation about the best way that you feel um, is appropriate to mitigate those risks within the context of everything else going on in your life. So the, the sudden death risk markers that have been identified uh, include a uh, high degree of heart muscle thickening greater than that 30 millimeters, uh, recent unexplained fainting events, family history of people dying suddenly, especially if they're a close relative, um, what we call an aneurysm within the heart. And when, and for those individuals who developed or progressed to end stage hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with their ejection fraction of less than 50%. Um, other risk markers are short runs of ventricular tachycardia on monitoring. So we will frequently have uh, patients wear external heart monitors to try to look for this. And then another risk marker is whether or not there's extensive scarring or fibrosis of the heart. And that's defined as um, the amount of that gadolinium enhancement of greater than 15% 15 per, 15 of the total uh, mass of the heart. Another way to look at this risk um, is, was, was created by the European Society of Cardiology a few years ago. And uh, it uses some modeling to try to predict somebody's risk based on a number of different factors. Some of them overlap with how um, with those factors that we use um, here in the United States. Um, it includes age, maximal wall thickness, interestingly enough, left atrial size and amount of obstruction. And then some things that we mentioned before, family history, uh, unexplained fainting and non-sustained um, ventricular tachycardia. Uh, which are short runs of ventricular car cardio that may be asymptomatic for people. Um, this was validated in several thousand HCM patients, um, uh, both um, of a variety of different ethnicities, and um, has been a recommended approach in both the European Society of Cardiology and also in the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association joint guidelines that came out in, in 2020. Um, it categorizes the risks as being um, low, intermediate, or high, uh, based on what they perceive as a five-year risk uh, percentage. Uh, and they make some recommendations here on thresholds at which ICDs or defibrillators should be considered. Now, um, each it has to be um, individualized for each individual patient. There's a lot of um, uh, conflicted opinions about whether or not this is the right approach. Uh, and some vocal critics of this type of um, modeling. Um, but I do think that it has a role in sort of um, assessing risk, especially um, uh, uh, in terms of the context of shared decision-making. Now, I, I, I hope I didn't scare anybody in terms of trying to uh, explain some of the risks because when we look at the contemporary treatment pathways for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they're actually quite good. Um, many patients, um, half or more, 
uh, have a very benign prognosis. They have absolutely normal longevity with very few symptoms. Um, we look at uh, various types of those um, tr uh, clinical courses uh, for patients that are at risk of sudden death, we can start to uh, implant defibrillators. I'll show you a slide on that um, next that shows the good outcomes with that approach. Um, for patients that have progressive heart failure and they're obstructive, while well, we have very good medications, we have better medications coming along next month. And we have some septal reduction procedures for patients that develop heart failure in stage heart failure, uh, transplant is an option. And for patients who develop atrial fibrillation and are at risk of stroke, we have blood thinners, drugs, and ablations. So in the modern era, the outcomes uh, and prognosis for patients with hypertrophic heart myopathy are quite good. This uh, figure, this graph on the, on the left here shows the um, changes in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy related mortality over time. So initially, when um, back in the 1960s and 70s, when um, the sort of the first uh, cohorts of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients uh, began to be collected at the NIH and some of the other institutions, um, the predicted rate of death or the observed rate of, of mortality was about 6% per year. When you started to um, have uh, other centers and probably had lower risk hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients included in that, the mortality was 1.5% per year. And when you look at the contemporary treatment strategies uh, with including uh, ICDs, including um, treatment of atrial fibrillation and including uh, treatments of the obstruction, we're down to 0.5% per year in terms of HCM-related mortality. And that's lower than the general US population uh, at large. So age match control population, uh, the mortality rate was higher than what was observed in HCM. So overall, a very favorable prognosis in the modern era. When we look at the highest risk subgroup, and that's the individuals with ICDs, we also see that years after IDCD implant, their survival and their expected, uh, their survival was um, identical to what was uh, expected for their age and risk uh, factors. So, uh, and lastly, um, before we, uh, uh, before I open it up to questions, I just wanted to go over real quick uh, a couple of things about um, uh, our hypertrophic cardiomyopathy center at the University of Washington. And first off, what to expect at a clinic visit? Well, usually your first clinic visit with us is with an ATM provider. Um, and at each clinic visit, we'll, we'll assess symptoms, the risk of abnormal heart rhythms, we'll assess family history who might who else in the family might be at risk of having hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We do a lot of initial testing uh, to understand uh, the heart a little bit better. That can include echo, uh, MRI tests, stress testing, and rhythm monitoring. Um, all of that uh, leads to us to uh, perhaps do some referrals to either the geneticist uh, or to a proceduralist or to our heart rhythm doctors. This is our team of uh, providers at the University of Washington. Uh, this is myself up here up top. So HCM patient here is in the center, it certainly is the person that uh, we're all focused on. Um, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy providers, we now have a few of them here at the University of Washington. Myself, uh, I've been doing it for about 10 years now. Janie Sabla, uh, who is a cardiologist who's been at the University of Washington for about two to three years now. Um, and Janie, uh, I'm sorry, Johnny Medina, who's a nurse practitioner who recently joined our program. Uh, Chris Patton is, a, is our main electrophysiology or heart rhythm doctor. We have two geneticists we're very fortunate to work with. Um, uh, in most uh, ATM programs have genetic counselors, but not geneticists. We have two geneticists at our uh, disposal who have been um, excellent in terms of providing timely patient care. Um, the advanced imaging team, we have a, a team of research coordinators that's helped us with some of the research studies we've been able to uh, participate in. We have a whole heart failure transplant team at our disposal. Um, Laura, Laura Ayatunji is our, um, uh, the cardiac surgeon who has taken over the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, surgeries. Uh, and I have to say, she's done a phenomenal job. Uh, Ed Barrier was here for about 20 years doing uh, the surgery she took over a couple of years ago uh, and has really latched onto it uh, and uh, made it her own. She's flown out to some of the major centers in, uh, across the country to learn from the experts uh, and has brought that back to us uh, here at the University of Washington. And then from an interventional cardiology perspective, we have Zach Steinberg, who's been doing our alcohol ablations for us. Okay, thank you very much. I'll uh, see if there's any questions.
Uh, if anyone has a question, you can type it into the Q&A box um, or also put it into the chat and we'll get those answered. Uh, Dr. Owens, just a quick question on COVID and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Is there any takeaways for that? Uh, a, a great question. Um, so um, we think that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients are not at especially high risk of developing complications uh, with their COVID, but we do recommend, uh, you know, of course, vaccine uh, for all individuals uh, with HCM or other risk factors. That's great. Uh, we have a question of two or of, of your three siblings have atypical HCM. Should you be screened for it despite being asymptomatic? Yes. So um, the current recommendations are for all first degree relatives of a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to undergo screening. And screening consists of an echo and an EKG. Um, and uh, that should be repeated every three to five years if the initial um, screening turns up negative. So if you don't have any evidence of heart muscle thickening on the initial screen, we still recommend serial screening every three to five years. There's also an approach that can be taken by using genetic testing, and it's a little bit more cost effective if um, the sibling is able to be gene tested and a causal uh, change in the genes is identified. That change can then be used to identify anybody in the family who might be at risk. All right, any other questions? Great. And in terms of, lastly, um, in terms of reaching out to you or the rest of the team, uh, best way just to call into the, the Heart Institute Clinic and ask for a, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy screening or what is the best way to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, you know, we do the screening events for or the screening um, for uh, family members that can easily be set up uh, we're happy to help uh, in that regard. Um, you can just put in a, patients don't even have to be, have a referral. We can usually just do self-referrals um, and, uh, and then we'll get it all set up for them. Perfect. Well, thank you all for joining and thank you, Dr. Owens, for the time today. Really appreciate it. It was a great presentation. Um, again, if anyone needs any extra uh, information, I'll make sure to post this video um, as well as providing some information in both our Facebook page and a follow-up email to everybody who attended today. But thank you again so much, Dr. Owens. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Goodbye. Okay,